Some places, my friends, in this world are more dangerous and terrifying than we might first expect and should never be experienced by humans for fear of losing sanity or worse, okay? These places include the Amazon rainforest, apparently, as well as the lowest rated section on IMDb. That's right, today we'll be trying to just survive watching this film together. And I guess along the way we can try to survive the vengeful forest threats as well in this film. Uh, that is called Jungle Run. The movie opens with a group of workers cutting down trees and digging up dirt in the rainforest. The work is halted by the archaeologist on site, Nicholas Kieran, who has just found an ancient tribal statue. As he explains to the lead worker that it appears to be based on the Kurapira, a guardian of the Amazon, a piece of the statue's crown starts to glow. Excited by the prospect of profiting from this artifact, the worker proposes that they don't report this finding and instead sell it for a profit, much to Nick's dislike. As the lead worker goes to remove the glowing stone with a pickaxe, it unleashes a high-pitched ringing that forces everyone to cover their ears. The lead man next falls into a sinkhole, although we can clearly see he's just sitting in a small ditch they dug on set. Nevertheless, He's attacked by CGI ants from the late 19th century and cries out for help. The ground fully gives away and we see him fall off screen. I don't know why he didn't try to grab, you know, the ground's edges or anything, but hey, uh, it's one character less. It's a good start. We then cut to four days later, where a woman is paying a man named Lebec and his two crew members for a boat trip to the rainforest. This woman is Amanda Kieran, and she, along with her brother Scott, are going to look for their father after he failed to return from the event we have just witnessed. They are joined by another woman, Vera Ortek, who runs the firm that hired the workers, including their father. She is going to investigate why the entire crew lost contact and disappeared. Nice to see a higher up actually concerned enough about their employees to go looking for them. During their voyage, we learned that the Brazilian Navy had combed the area with helicopters and found nothing and law enforcement believed the workers were simply attacked by drug traffickers. <laughs> That's right, why go check for them? They were just attacked by drug traffickers, right? Navarra doubts that theory, however, since her group did a lengthy assessment before working and even paid off locals in the area to avoid conflict. They eventually dock at the riverside and head into the forest to arrive at the workers' campsite. They find leftover equipment, including their dad's journal, which mentions a location known as No Way Out that he and the rest of the workers may have gone to. Of course, makes total sense. Now Vera walks around while complaining about not having a cell phone signal because clearly every horror movie needs that same issue before she screams in terror at a group of frogs. That's right, my friends. I know the CGI is bad, but I wouldn't say it's scream worthy, okay? Although it is an abnormally large number of them and they are all death staring the group for some reason. Now Lebec warns her not to move, as Vera, seemingly reading all of our minds, asks what the hell is going on. He says that they are dark frogs and very poisonous. I guess giant ones too, because these are all the size of bullfrogs. While it's true that dark frogs are poisonous, very few are deadly to humans, okay? And even fewer can poison you via contact alone. So as long as we don't start eating or handling these frogs barehanded, we should be just fine. On top of that, these frogs use their poison passively as a way to punish stupid predators that attempt to eat them. They don't leap at attackers. However, after Vera takes a few steps back, Lebec shouts for them all to run before the frogs start darting towards them, which I guess means that this particular group does attack people. They make it out to a clearing and I guess the dart frogs just gave up. Everyone is okay though, except for Lebec, who had been bitten by a frog. Concerned about the poison spreading, he tells his crewmates to cut his leg off. Now, I don't think this film knows the difference between poisonous and venomous, but either way, after doing so much running and after having his heart rate increased, the poison would have definitely spread by now, right? Meaning removing the leg will only increase health complications from blood loss at this point, especially with the femoral artery being there. Dart frog poison is a neurotoxin that is unpleasant, but not usually life-threatening. As long as the afflicted individual is able to still breathe, we just have to wait it out. But thankfully though, before they cut it off, a blind man shows up, who I guess just happened to be walking through the rainforest at that time. And even though he is blind with no walking stick or seeing eye companion, he walks right up to the group, kneels down at Lebec and realizes that it's 
frog poison. That's right. I guess this guy is daredevil or something. The blind man happens to have some antidote with him, because of course he does, even though no such antidote exists in real life, and uses it to heal Lebec. The magic blind man next tells him that the destruction of the Amazon has awoken the Kurapira, and that is why the village is empty. Not sure what village he's talking about though, but I guess it's not important. When Amanda asks about her dad, Blind Man says that the Kirapira has him, and they must find the heart of the jungle and destroy it to free their father. The heart holds the demon's powers, and without it, it will die. And even though this magic man just saved Lebec's life, or more realistically, stopped his suffering at least, Lebec doubts everything said and even claims that those frogs just must not have been the poisonous kind. Okay, the Blind Man returns to the jungle while the rest of the group returns to the boats. I guess that was interesting. Let's review the journey so far still, show. For the workers in the beginning, there was no way to know that the idol had special powers. If we were superstitious, maybe we could have avoided it, but if that was the case, we probably would not have agreed to desecrate a sacred land in the first place to incur its wrath for monetary gain to fund our only fan addiction, right? That it doesn't really make sense. As for the siblings and the firm owner, I am not sure why they didn't get a larger group of more experienced and prepared excursionists for the search and rescue mission. However, since they did both happen to arrive at Lebec, maybe he's the best for the job, or at least the best they could get on on such short notice. If they are going on such a treacherous expedition though, they should come prepared, right? Bring a satellite phone so you don't have to worry about signals, bring plenty of food and water, let people know of your location and expected return times, dress appropriately, and bring weapons such as firearms. I for one wouldn't want to harm any wildlife or indigenous people, but hey, if it comes down to self-defense, I would rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. This would come in handy if, for example, a platoon of dart frogs decided to attack for some reason. Speaking of which, dart frogs may not normally behave this way in nature, but we soon after learn of the Kurapira. If it is real, it could very well explain the strange and aggressive behavior of these animals, as a forest spirit guardian would likely be able to coerce wildlife to do its bidding. This means we can't expect any animals to behave in a standard way and should be on guard for abnormal attacks. That's right, man. Logic. Since the blind man is not just the only other person we have seen so far, but knowledgeable and with unique medicine and folklore, we should have them come along with us for help if they are willing. That, or we should at least interrogate them further about the things they are saying, like what exactly the heart of the jungle is, where we could find it, and what the Kirapiri's abilities are, and how they know so much in the first place. At the very least, see if they can give us some of that antidote for the road, just in case we run into more frogs again in the future. Now back on the ship, Amanda now wants to visit the area mentioned in her dad's journal. The back refuses at first until Vera offers to pay for the extra voyage. As they close in on their destination though, they hear something hitting the boat. They look into the water and find a CGI piranha, my friends. That's right, it's going down. The back gets his shotgun ready and... Wait, what? He had a shotgun the entire time but left it on the boat? Yeah, you don't want to employ people like that, do you? Now the piranhas start to throw themselves head first into the boat's motor to the point it gets clogged with their guts. Which is definitely not normal behavior and likely caused by the Kurapira's influence, I guess? One of the crewmates has the brilliant idea of leaning over to the side of the boat in order to grab the propeller for cleaning. Now I think it would be pretty hard to remove just the propeller by hand while still on the boat, but you know. Also fish guts wouldn't stop the propeller in the first place, it should be the motor itself that is clogged. They should be fixing or cleaning that first, especially since they could do that from the safety of the boat. Miraculously though, they are able to remove the propeller even in piranha infested water. After barely cleaning the fish off, they return the propeller just as easily as they removed it, again without any tools or equipment and all while still on the boat. This time though the piranha jump out of the water and latch onto the crew member. While this would undoubtedly hurt, he should be just fine with only minor laceration. Or he could pick this time to go for a swim and jump into the water to be quickly eaten. I mean, well, with no concern for the man who was just eaten alive, the women bark at Lebec to do something. He tells everyone to use the poles to stab into the water and get to shore. I guess they have just returned from a trip to Venice. Clearly these poles are not long enough to reach the water floor, but they do. 
It works, and they make it to land. Just in time too, as the piranha had started eating through the hull of the boat, and caused it to sink shortly after. Yeah, that's right, the piranha ate through the hull of the boat. I guess the jungle spirit also gives these animals superpowers. After regrouping for a moment, they continued the rest of their travel by foot. While traveling, Amanda asked Lebec about translating some of her father's journal entries that use native languages. He deciphers the words as sun and water, which the group think could be clues for the heart of the jungle. Of course, makes total sense. Hmm. After finding some notes left by the workers, they suddenly run into CGI alligators. Hell yeah, let's go. I'm not sure how those were able to sneak up on them or why they're so far away from the riverside, but hey, I guess we can just chalk those factors up to the Kurapira's powers, right? Now, as they try to back away slowly, the film editors place two more CGI gators behind them. Or, I mean, two other gators have snuck up on them. They scream and run, separating into groups, as one lunges for Scott and grabs him by his back. He eventually wises up and stops playing tug war with this 700 pound animal and lets go of the bag so that he can escape now too. Scott is now on his own, with Amanda and Lebec in one group and Vera with the crewmates in the other. While running with Amanda, Lebec casually kills a gator with a single machete chop to the head, making them seem a lot less threatening. Guess these two will be alright then. Vera and the crew member eventually hear Scott calling out for them, but the crew member notices that the cries for help are identical to one another, as if they were an imitation or a recording. So instead, they ignore it and carry on. Good on them for not falling into a trap, but now we have to ask, what is imitating Scott? Well, I guess we'll never find out. Or will we? Well, we'll see, I guess. After a while, Lebec and Amanda find the crew's work site. I guess they aren't concerned for the others they left behind to either be lost in the jungle or eaten by those gators. After examining the location, Lebec's leading theory as to what happened is that a local tribe sacrificed them all as a revenge for deforestation, even with zero evidence of any struggle. After this, they continue onto a bridge, a very clearly modern and well-built bridge that the film tries to pass off as an old and crappy bridge. I'm not even sure why they need to cross it, as it looks like there is just solid ground beneath it, but hey, I would pick it too. Now suddenly, indigenous tribesmen appear from the opposite side and hold the two at spear and arrow point. They raise their arms to show that they're not a threat and kneel in front of the tribe when Scott happens to find them right at this time. Even though he is far away and could escape, he decides to kneel as well, as they are all taken prisoner. They're all taken back to the village and Lebec says that if they're lucky they will only be killed and worse, they will be eaten. So either killed or killed. Got it. Thanks bro. Why did they surrender though if they knew these were the only outcomes? Maybe now would have been a good time to use our shotgun, as I doubt that any of these primitive screwheads would have been able to handle a single blast from our boomstick, right? Scott wants to know why they would kill, and Lebec says that it's probably because he is wearing his father's construction crew jacket, the same one the workers wear while they destroy the forest. While this does make some sense, it goes against what Vera told us about extensive research and paying off the people in this area. Now, they were thrown into a shoddy cage where Vera and the crewmates already are. Nice to have the group back together again, right? Now, they aren't caged long, however, as the tribe quickly come back to grab everyone, dragging them to a sacrificial circle surrounded with bones. Amanda, I guess wanting closure for her missing father, asks Lebec to inquire with the tribe if they killed her dad as well. I would say it doesn't hurt to ask, but the moment he does, he is chosen for the first to be sacrificed. Ooh. An executioner raises a curved blade over Lebec's neck, while the entire tribe starts chanting, which gets Amanda all excited since it's a chant she recognizes from her father's journal, meaning he must have been here before. That's all nice and stuff, but priorities, woman, a man is about to be taken offline in front of you. Now, before the final blow is struck, giant CGI spiders leap from the trees to kill all of the tribesmen to save the gang. The characters take this opportunity to flee as the spiders just kind of stand there, staring into nothingness. Now, I'm no longer sure whose side the Kurapira is on or what their goal is anymore, but, uh, I... Now this expedition is kind of off the rails as we can clearly witness, right? And I can't tell if they're closer to finding the missing people or the legendary heart of the jungle. Now let's take a rest here for a bit to see if there's anything we could have done differently still. That's the fun of it, right? Now first of all, let's talk about the piranha, my friends. Simply, don't stick our faces over the side of the boat with carnivorous leaping fish in the water to stay alive. It's, it's simple. Next, we should turn off the motor since it can't be damaged if it's stationary. 
After that, we could use a pole stick, assuming we can bend the laws of physics like this movie does, and make it to the shore. As for the gators, they seem pretty weak without their heads. Lebec could have gone more on a rampage and chopped off a few more of them to save everyone around them so that they could stick together, or used, you know, the shotgun for the love of God. Speaking of which, as I said it before, we could have used the shotgun against a tribe as they came to get us on the bridge, if we knew they were going to be nothing but hostile anyway. The only reason not to do this would be if we were surrounded. However, the bridge was very narrow, with all the foes on one side close up in a choke point. Ask anyone who plays first person shooters and they will tell you that this is the perfect spot to get a quad. Okay. Also, if the tribe is as primitive as they seem, a single blast might be all it takes, and the rest could be scared off. Either way, better than just surrendering and being eaten alive, right? The group survived the night, somehow, and I guess just slept in a forest without any sort of gear or shelter, and despite the multitude of, you know, CGI things crawling around. The movie starts to lose focus here a bit, if you can call anything so far focused. Well, Amanda acts like she has figured things out, saying the tree the tribesmen were going to sacrifice Lebec in front of was the heart of the jungle, which leads Lebec to say the spiders came out to look for the heart. I don't see the connection there, maybe you do, but this gives the group the idea that their dad found the heart already and hid it somewhere. Kind of Gold D. Rogers style, I guess. Amanda next repeats what the blind man said about destroying the heart to defeat the demon and Vera gets super excited, like this is the grandest revelation in the world, despite it being something they were already told several scenes ago. Vera is suddenly super on board with finding this heart, even though before she was the one trying to ignore the blind man to focus on finding the workers. She even goes so far to say they need to destroy it and that creature right now, despite no specific creature being evident thus far, right? Could be just a freaking myth, I don't know. So the group is finally going to take the advice they were given hours ago, yet still have no leads. However, a single word of the chant the tribe sang translates to water, prompting Amanda to say that this is the basic function of all life, so the heart of the jungle must be at a waterfall. Yeah, it's that easy, my friends. Scott tries to stop them, saying that they will all die if they go there. Not sure what makes him think that this place will be any more or less dangerous than anywhere else they have been so far, but okay. Amanda ignores him, claiming that she will find dead. Vera ignores him too, saying that she will destroy the heart, because that is suddenly her life's purpose. But they finally get to the waterfall and enter a cave system behind it. They hear their dad calling out for help and rush inside. Amanda suddenly stops Scott, saying that the Kirapira mimics sound. Lebec and his crewmates then hear a high-pitched sound and know that it's the heart of the jungle, because every high-pitched sound must come from a philosopher's stone or something. They want to take it for themselves, so they rush in as well. The two approach a green glowing section of the cave wall, which seems to hypnotize Lebec, while his crewmate is suddenly eaten whole by a giant snake. In the background, kind of? Showing no remorse for the lives just lost, Amanda and Vera just want to leave right now, claiming that this area is just a trap. As they go to leave, more giant CGI snakes arrive. Amanda calmly picks up a knife, stands on a rock and patiently waits to get eaten alive. Scott and Vera are also quickly swallowed. Of course, predictably, Amanda just cuts her way out. She faces the remaining snakes, lopping one's head off in a single strike, even though the blade is nowhere near long enough for that, and kills the other one off screen, because they ran out of budget. Probably. While they are recuperating, they see a glowing green rock in front of them and immediately identify it as the heart of the jungle. I'm not sure what this glowing green wall that hypnotized Lebec was if this is the actual heart though, or what the heart is doing in this exact spot unceremoniously laying on the ground, but hey, uh, fair enough, no? We jump cut to them outside, again probably for budget reasons. They start freaking out because they can't hear the waterfall anymore despite being well, miles away from the waterfall. They next find Lebec tied to a tree with a bunch of vines. I guess better than tentacles, right? They don't even attempt to save or help the poor guy and soon hear their dad calling. They once again both excitedly rush where the voice is coming from, but don't stop this time, despite the possibility of this being another Kirapira trap mimicking sounds, as they just claimed two minutes ago. They find their dad, also CGI vine, to a tree. Turns out that he survived for a few days in a camper before somehow being captured right here. All right. Scott gets the knife to cut him loose, but Amanda stops him, saying the vines will crush him if they try. I guess she got some inside information now. Now the vines suddenly create a sinkhole, reach in and pull out the Kurapira, my friends, allowing us to finally see it in all its glory. 
As it's waking up, Amanda smashes the heart of the jungle. This removes all the from their dead, allowing him to move. The Kuripira isn't dead though, and instead is now freed. Their dad remains calm, even taking Scott's weapon away, claiming that he won't need that. He states that they just need to do something with the gem shards to tame the beast. Again, not sure where this information is coming from, but hey, somebody get the gem shards now, please. While they're fiddling with that, Vera comes from nowhere with Lebec's shotgun and blows the funk out of this monster. I'm not sure why she felt the need to do this, other than you know, having a little bit of fun, since this creature was leaving them alone and even walking away. But now it responds by making a giant CGI fly trap to grab her in an instant. <laughs> I guess, yeah, better leave that shit alone, man. The creature afterwards just walks away, so I guess that gem shard idea didn't matter so much. The reunited family celebrate as if several people didn't just die in the last 24 hours and head home. Now we close on a shot of the Kuripira as it roars into the jungle. Credits roll. That's right, we made it to the end. Kind of.